How's everybody doing tonight? Some of you guys are like, eh, we're, we're all right, we're all right. We've been in this series talking about hearing the voice of God. And Pastor Tim uh, kicked off our first two uh, Sundays with that, hearing the voice of God uh, through prayer, hearing the voice of God through his word. And so tonight we're going to continue uh, this series and for many more Sunday nights to come with our associate pastors in the evening and Pastor Tim in the morning, talking about hearing God's voice. You know, my desire for you tonight and my desire even for myself is that we wouldn't just hear the words of a man speaking to a group of people, but rather we would hear from God. Does anybody want to hear from God tonight? You know, why wait? Why wait when he wants to speak? And so since you are uh, here tonight, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, but why don't you stand your feet all over this place? We're going to seek the Lord in one more word of prayer. We're going to ask him specifically to speak. Lord God, we are here to seek after you. We are here, Lord God, because we want more of you. We are here because you've called us. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, in your name, that you would speak tonight through your word. Hide your servant behind the cross and may your name, Jesus, be high and lifted up. We pray all these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen and amen. Well, a few years ago, Pastor Clark and I pioneered a, a missions trip that our church now does on an annual basis to the country of Nepal. For those of you who don't know, Nepal is on the other side of the world. It was about a 24-hour period that we were either in a plane or in an airport traveling to get to this place. And no one else from our church had ever gone on this endeavor. Actually, we connected with a pastor there who was the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Nepal, who uh, actually went to Gordon-Conwell here on the north shore of Boston and had attended Calvary before he went back. And he invited us over and we went. And the call was simple, to speak the word of God, to share God's love in these youth camps all throughout the country. And so Pastor Clark and I went and we were, we were speaking. And the first time we went, we went to connect with some people and we're, we're speaking and people have this kind of like blank look on their face, kind of like you do right now. And, and they were just, and it, it, was, it was interesting because I'm like, yo, this is God's word. This is, but here's the thing, when you're in introducing yourself, when you're trying to connect with people, even outside of the message, we're just in, in the buildings or in the fields meeting people. Hi, I'm Brigham Lee. And they just got this blank look on their faith. And, and, and Pastor Samuel just taps us on the show. Listen, um, you need a translator. <laughs> so often we assume that everyone can speak our language, Right. So often we assume, well, I'm speaking English, right? I mean, just learn my language, which is just rude. But uh, uh, here I am. I'm, I'm, I, they, they didn't understand. They never spoke in English. I needed a translator, a means by which what was being expressed could be communicated in an understandable way. Does that make sense? Now again, Pastor Tim's been preaching on this series on hearing the voice of God through prayer, hearing the voice of God through his holy word. But one of the other ways that God speaks to us, how he transmits, how he translates his will to us in an understandable way is through our desires, through what our hearts delight in. Now, here's the thing about that. I say something like that. Hey, God wants to speak to you about his will for your life through what you desire. And some of you recognize, well, that could be problematic though, right? Because I don't always desire the things that I know that God desires. The problem with pleasure is that most people struggle with the things that, that they enjoy. Even on some level, sometimes we just feel so guilty about having something we enjoy. Whether it be that quart of ice cream, preferably Brigham's. And you're like, I know what this is gonna do to my hips, but I know how good it tastes on my lips. 
There's, we, sometimes we just struggle to enjoy things well because it's like, oh, we feel guilt or we, we, we know that we shouldn't, we shouldn't want things more than we want God. We don't want to make things an idol in our life. And we've got these desires and these passions, right? And God wants to speak through them, but we recognize that there's, that there's a danger there when we're not intentional to let those things become greater in our lives than God is. So we're wary of our pleasures. We're suspicious of our desires because so often they can be of the flesh and not according to the will of God. And listen, some desires in our heart, they are sinful, no doubt about it. And those sinful desires must be crucified. But we do also need to hear God's voice in our gladness, speaking into our heart recognizing that there are things that we enjoy, things that we delight in, things that we desire that are from him and lead us into his perfect will, clearly speaking in a way that we can understand. So let me ask you some questions tonight. These are rhetorical. Please do not yell out your answers. We're gonna learn some stuff about you that we just weren't ready to learn. What do you dream about? What do you dream about? What do you enjoy? We have these dreams and and desires for the future, but then there's these things that we enjoy. What do you enjoy? Who do you envy? Go ahead, be honest with yourself. I know we're not supposed to envy other people. I got it. I know. But, but who do you desire to emulate? Who would you like for your life to look a little bit more like? Okay. All right. Praise God. Somebody shouted it out. Here we are. Our passage tonight where we're going to be reading teaches us four things about our relationship with God that will help us to hear his voice in our lives. Four keys that are all centered on desiring God's destiny for our lives and delighting in him. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 37 tonight. Psalm chapter 37, verses 1 through 7. And here's what it says. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. First and foremost, first of four things tonight First of four things tonight that are centered on desiring God's destiny for our lives and delighting in him that will ultimately help us to hear his voice. Here's number one. Trust in the Lord and do good. Verse one tells us trust in the Lord. Uh, uh, Excuse me. um, Verse three tells us trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. I mean, what does it mean to trust in the Lord though? What does it mean to put your trust in him? Here's the thing, though. Here's what it doesn't mean, okay? It it doesn't mean thinking that you can live any kind of way you want and God will just work it out. I'll say that again, maybe to this side. Trusting in the Lord doesn't just mean living any kind of way you want and trusting that the Lord will just work it out. Oh, I trust the Lord, which means I can do any kind of mess I want. Somebody need to hear it? It's there, okay? But trusting in the Lord means believing that what he says about how you should live is better than anything else. 
Trusting in the Lord means believing that what he says about how you should live and who you should be is better than anything else. It means knowing that seeking him in prayer and in his word is better than working out. It's better than eating right. It's better than working hard. It's better than making tons of money, sex, drugs, alcohol, or any other lie that the world will tell you is the best. The world will tell you being your best self means looking the best and feeling the best and all these types of things. And, you know, I might have a part of it in terms of what God wants to do. But the world will also tell you that uh, uh, looking after number one is everything. The world will tell you that giving in to anything and everything you want is best. Why does the passage follow the call to trust in the Lord with and do good? It says trust in the Lord and do good. Because doing what the Lord calls us to do means that you trust him. If you're willing to do what the Lord is asking you to do, that means that you trust him. You see, there are some things that we already know God wants us to do. And we can hear about them in his word and in prayer. God will never reveal something to us in prayer that contradicts his word. So what we're talking about tonight is trusting the Lord. It means that you trust that what he is saying is better than anything else anyone else is saying. To trust in the Lord is to be led by the Lord like a sheep following the shepherd into a place that is safe and enjoyable even if it means going through some places that look scary in order to get there. Why would you follow the shepherd to a place of enjoyment and safety? Because you trust him. Even though you got to go through some stuff, you can trust him. And you will take good steps following after the good shepherd because you trust him. Ultimately, guys, we have to desire the destiny of God. We have to desire what God wants for us. And we have to want what God wants for us. And if you want to hear the voice of God in your life, it means desiring his destiny. But that means you're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to trust him. Second thing our passage teaches us tonight about hearing the voice of God in our lives, even as we desire what he wants, is to take delight in the Lord. Verse four, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now listen to this. This is one of the most powerful ideas in all of scripture. If you delight in the Lord, he will give you what you delight in. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you himself. That is profound. But it seems a little bit like circular logic, right? Circular reasoning. It seems like we're saying, if you buy a car from the lot on the left side of the road, you'll get a car. Or you can buy a car from the lot on the right side of the road and you'll get a car. It seems as if we're saying that I can be delighted in the things of the world and it will satisfy, or I can be delighted in the things of God and he'll satisfy too. It's as if we can be satisfied with either one. It seems like that's the argument, but what What God's word is really saying is if you buy a car from the left side of the road, it will break down and fail. But if you desire what is on the right, you will be given a ride that never breaks down, that never fails, and is guaranteed by the creator of the only perfect vehicle that's ever been made. If you delight only in the pleasures of the world, then that's all you're going to get. There is a finite amount of joy, a finite amount of happiness, a finite amount of satisfaction that you can take from the physical world. There's only so much of it. Eventually, all that stuff's going to wither and fade. But if you delight in the things of God, if you delight yourself in the Lord, then God will give you what you delight in in infinite measure. 
See, if you delight in the things of the world, they're going to pass away. Eventually, they're going to they're going to leave you. But if you delight in the Lord, he will give you an infinite amount of himself. And it's better. You see, we've skewed the objects of our comparison. As if the things of this world are anywhere near close to what God offers us in him. C.S. Lewis explains, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. All this world has to offer you is death and taxes. God has more. Here's what not to desire. Deuteronomy chapter five. You shall not cover your neighbor, covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Mark four. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful in your life. James chapter four. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire? desires that battle within you you desire but do not have so you kill you covet but you cannot get what you want so you quarrel and fight you do not have because you do not ask God and when you ask you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures but instead we should take delight in him Matthew chapter 6, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Mark Batterson, in his book, Whisper, How to Hear the Voice of God, which, again, we're going through that book even in this series. I encourage you to pick up a copy at christianbook.com. He explains that in order to delight in the Lord, first, we've got to seek God. In order to delight in the Lord, we have to seek him. In fact, we can't just seek him like we seek any other thing. Like, okay, I want this and some of that and some of this. No, we've got to put God first. You see, seeking God first is delighting yourself in him. Seeking God first is giving him the first word and the last word in your life. Seeking God first is making sure his voice is the loudest voice in your life. He explains that we do that, we seek God first because he can change our desires and he can upload new desires within us that point us to his will. And then those desires actually become spiritual compasses by which we will navigate the will of God in our lives. Guys, we have to trust in the Lord if we want to desire the destiny of God, if we want to walk in his perfect will, if we want to hear his voice, we've got to trust in the Lord. We have to take the light in the Lord, putting him first. Everybody say first. That's not second. That's not third. It's not fourth. It's not fifth. You want me to keep counting? Somebody say amen. It's first. Third thing we need to do, if we want to desire the destiny of God, if we want to hear his voice, our passage tonight tells us we need to commit our way to the Lord. Verse five, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. Verse six, and he will make your righteous reward. Anybody want a reward? If you don't, I'll take yours. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Maybe you've heard this saying before. Uh, some people say, pray like it all depends on Jesus, but work like it all depends on you. You ever heard that statement before? 
pray like it all, pray hard like it all depends on God, and then work as hard as you possibly can. But I say, instead of that, I mean, here's, here's my thought. Pray like it all depends on Jesus. Work like it all depends on Jesus. Think like it all depends on Jesus. Speak like it all depends on Jesus. Act like it all depends on Jesus. And know that it all depends on Jesus. The sovereign God of the universe, when I'm thinking about which way I want to go, how, what, what plan am I going to commit to? Listen, the sovereign God of the universe is my plan A, my plan B, my plan C through Z. There's nothing that has ever been without my Lord and King. And so I'm not trying to commit my way to something I desire. I want to trust him. I want to desire him. And I want to commit to him. You see, there's three things that God wants for us. You, you, you might not have known this, but God wants some things for you. He wants some good things for you. Three things that God wants for you. First is to delight yourself in him. He wants you to enjoy his word. He wants you to enjoy his presence. And he wants you to be disciplined in it. Oh, snap. That's a bad word, isn't it? Oh, man. We got to be disciplined. It's not just going to, like, happen. Listen, nobody ever stepped into anything amazing without work and a foundation of, of, of things that came before. To delight ourselves in him, enjoying God's word and his presence. And guess what? This is a discipline. This means getting up and reading his word first, seeking him in prayer first. This means try, walking in his ways and, and leaning on him. But guess what? Those disciplines can turn into desires if you delight yourself in the Lord. Those disciplines will turn into desires. One day you'll find yourself, oh, okay, let me get up and seek him. And the next day, okay, let me get up and seek him. Okay, let me get up and seek him. By the fourth day, you're like, it's, it's, I'm, I'm in a rhythm. Two weeks later, you're saying, well, I got to get up and seek him. Oh my goodness, I've got to. A month later, you're saying, I can't live without getting up and seeking him. All of a sudden, those disciplines turn into desires for more. There's a lot of things in this world we can become addicted to. I want to become addicted to God. So God wants for us to delight ourselves in him. He wants for us to want him. The second thing he wants for us is to delight in one another. Someone once wrote that hell is other people. Well, they were hanging out with some awful people. The reality is that God has given us the gift of one another. He wants us to delight ourselves in him. He wants us to delight in one another. What did Jesus say? He said, love the Lord your God. With everything, heart, soul, mind, strength, love the Lord your God. And then what? Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. God wants some things for you. He wants you to want him. He wants you to love one another. And he wants you to delight in his creation. You know, there's some people out there who are really outdoorsy people. Anybody outdoor people? Met with someone this week who was like, yeah, in the summers back in the day, I used to just throw the tent out in the backyard. And that's where I slept all summer long. And I was like, wow, that sounds terrible. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I can't walk outside the door and see a beautiful snowfall or see a glorious sun, sunlit day and thank God for what he's made. And enjoy what he's, guys, he wants us, so many people are like, okay, following God is like drudgery and dreariness. And God's like, no, I want you to delight. I want you to be satisfied. I want you to be fulfilled in me. I want you to love one another and walk in that love and have the gift of each other. And I want you to delight in my creation. God leans over and he says, I made this for you. And here's the promise. We're in Psalm 37. Later on in the chapter, starting in verse 23, this is what it says. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, whew, I'm glad that's in there, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds them with his hand. 
Verse 25, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and live freely and their children will be a blessing. Do you know God wants you to walk, live, think, exist in freedom? He doesn't want you to be bound He doesn't want you to be enslaved. His desire is that you would desire him. His desire is that you would love one another. His desire for you is that you would enjoy his creation, knowing freedom. The freedom to live generously. The freedom to, to have from his hand everything that you could ever need or want when you want him. The call tonight is simple. If we want to hear the voice of God, We need to desire God's destiny, not the promises of the world. We need to desire him. And so our text tells us we need to trust in the Lord. If we want to desire his destiny, if we want to hear his voice, trust in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Listen, this is a sidebar. This is not my notes. This is for free, okay? We talk about committing your way to the Lord. We're talking about commitment. We're not talking about a, hey, let me just do a little trial run here and see how it goes. We're talking about putting a ring on it, okay? We're talking about saying, I am committed to the Lord from now until the day I die. And I will see, I will see what he wants to do. We're talking about commitment. But the fourth thing, the fourth thing our passage teaches us, God is speaking tonight and hear him. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Anybody ever tried to be patient before? Ever woke up and said, God, I just want to be a patient person today. I just want to be at peace. You walk downstairs and your three-year-old throws a, bo- a, a, a bowl of cereal on the floor. And you're just like, that's it. I've lost it. <laughs> God says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. You want to know what it means to be still? It means to be still. It's not, it's not a passive waiting, I promise you. It's an active waiting, and yet, it's still waiting. It's waiting patiently. You know, there's a statement out there. Uh, God, uh, God isn't always there right when you want him to be, but he's always on time. The idea that we're like, God, I need you here right now. And he's just like, wait. We're thinking, that's it. He didn't show up when I needed it. It's all over. There's nothing for it. And then later when he moves, we realize, wow, had you given me what I asked for when I wanted it, it would have destroyed me. But because you gave it to me in your time, in your will, in your way, it has restored my life. There is something about being still. There's something about being patient. There's something about waiting on the Lord. And it's hard to do, right? It's super hard to be patient. Because we're like, all right, God said wait. And the people around us are like, hey, you better do something. Hey, man, this is, this is getting crazy. No, God said to wait. No, you really, hey, something's got to give here. You waited a little bit. Hey, and it seems like the more we want to be patient, the more we want to wait, the louder the voices around us get. The voices in our own heart and life, the voices of the people closest to us. Hey, something's got to change. Something's got to give. And it's just boiling over. And the whole time, God's like, be cool. Mark Batterson explains that the fear of man keeps us from hearing and heeding the voice of God. You know, there's some practical steps to self-assessment. There's some practical steps to actually looking at our own desires and, and turning more towards the Lord. And those things ultimately are gonna be crucial 
in whether or not we can do that fourth step. Crucial in whether or not we can wait patiently on the Lord. The first part of our self-assessment comes from looking at our own ego. You see, God's word says that God opposes the proud. But when we look at a situation, when we look at a circumstance, when we look at our own life, God says to wait, and our ego says, but I can. He's like, wait for me, but I can do it. You know, perfect example, the Old Testament, King Saul, called by God, anointed by God, who prophesied before the people. Here's the king, and he's, he's preparing to make the sacrifice before the battle, and the prophet is late in coming. The prophet who's supposed to offer the sacrifice, who's supposed to do the ceremony, then we can go to battle. We do the ceremony, then we can go to battle. We do the, wait, where is this guy? And Saul waits, and he says, let us wait for Samuel. And the people say, we will. And then a day goes by, and they're like, um, we kind of got to fight the battle. Well, let us wait for Samuel. We will. And then more time passes. And Saul's like, uh, guys, we got to wait for Samuel. And they're like, no, we got to go fight. And Saul, to his shame, gets up and offers the sacrifice himself. He does it himself. He thinks Samuel ain't coming. Something waylaid him. We can't wait no more. And he gets up and he does it himself. And what happens? Right after he does the sacrifice, who shows up? Samuel. Samuel says, what's going on, man? You're supposed to wait. We'll do the sacrifice, and then we'll go into battle. But here, here, here you are taking it on to yourself. And ultimately, the real reasoning behind it wasn't just the battle. It wasn't just the pressure of the people. Saul knew he was anointed. Saul knew he had prophesied. Saul knew he was called. So Saul thought he could do it himself. Did you catch it? You see, there was ego. There was, I'm just as qualified. I can take this up. I know what God wants us to do. Let me do it in and of my own strength. Oh, no. Guys, we have to look inward at our own ego, recognizing God opposes the proud. Listen, if you are desiring the destiny of God, then you definitely don't want him opposing you. When, we, when he calls us to be still, oh my goodness. We gotta take these steps. We gotta assess what's going on with my own ego. We have to, we have to assess even the, the, the amount of desire. Listen, if you want something too much, and there is such a thing as wanting something too much, then that might be an indication that you want it for the, right reason, for the wrong reasons. It might be good, it might be great, it might be something fantastic, but if you want it too much, if you're just holding on to that thing too much, I mean, that, that's an assessment. We can use an assessment tool called, maybe I want this too much. Maybe my, my motives aren't right. So we have to assess our own ego. We have to assess our motives. And we also have to assess our emotion. You ever seen somebody get real emotional? Tom Brady uh, last week was doing an interview and they said, what do you love about football? He said, the thing I love about football is that I get to express the full range of my emotions. I get to be completely myself on the field. And if you've ever seen a Patriots game, he comes out and he's just like, let's go. And he's like screaming at everybody and cussing out offensive coordinators. It's crazy. Emotion can be a powerful thing, right? Man, expressing that, sometimes it just feels good. But the reality is that emotion is a great servant. It can be a great tool, but it is a terrible master. When you are led by your emotions uh, instead of led by the Lord, when you are led by what you feel instead of being led by the destiny, the, the desire for the destiny of God, for the, the voice of God and his will, instead of being willing to wait, that can be a rough thing. Even as we assess our own desires, we have to ask the question, does, it, does the desire wax or wane over time? Do I want it a lot sometimes and then not so much at other times? Like we've got we've to we've use some emotional intelligence when we think about our own desires. Because God tells us 
to be still. You know, some of us have no idea what we want because we sacrifice our desires on the altar of other people's expectations. Maybe you had a mother or father who always wanted you to be a doctor. You are going to be a doctor. And here you are as a doctor and you realize something. I don't want to be a doctor. We've got to take the time to be still. To wait on the Lord. To assess, is this my ego? Is this something I want too much? Is this just an emotional thing? We've got to be still. Do you want to hear the voice of God? If you do, he speaks through his word. He speaks through prayer. But listen, he speaks into and through our desires. The key is to desire the destiny of God, to desire what God wants, to desire more of him, to be willing to trust him, that he is who he says he is. To be willing to take delight in him. To be willing to commit everything we do to him. And to be willing to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. You see, you've got a choice. You can choose whether you will delight in the things of this world, whether you will delight in the carnal desires of your own heart. You've got you've to choose whether or not you're going to delight in the things of this world or whether you will delight in the Lord. Will you delight in the things of this world or will you delight in the Lord? You've got to choose whether you will desire the destiny of God. Because what you choose to delight in will determine what you are able to hear. Who you choose to delight in will determine who will influence the path of your life. It will determine what you can hear. If I choose not to wear my glasses, I will only be able to see about 12 inches or so in front of my face perfectly clearly. But anything beyond that, I won't have access to, including my notes. But if I choose to put on what is good and what is right and what is holy and what is powerful, then I'll be able to see further than I ever could have on my own. If we choose to delight in the world, we will only be able to hear what the world around us, the physical world, has to say. But if I desire the destiny of God, then I will be able to hear the voice of God that whispers from heaven, that speaks with the authority of all eternity, past, present, and future, that leads me into more than I could have ever asked for, more than I ever could have thought of, more than I ever could have dreamed of, more than I ever could have imagined. Do you want to hear more tonight? Do you want to hear from God tonight? Do you want to have more than just the little that this world around you have, has to offer? in comparison to the incomparable riches of almighty God. Oh my goodness, it's not even a contest. Now as the call tonight from his word is to delight yourself in the Lord, to desire the destiny of God. In a moment, we're going to pray, and these altars are going to be open. There'll be some people here who would love to pray with you. But before we do that, I want to make sure that God's word is sinking in tonight. You see, right now is that time of assessment. Right now is that time of reflection. Right now is that time to ask God, 
has my life and the fruit of what I've been doing, how I've been living, claim that I want you? Does it claim that I desire more of you? Does it claim that I want what you want more than anything else? You see, tonight, we really do have to make that choice. We have to choose whether or not we're going to want more of God. And ultimately, he is glorified in us when we find our satisfaction, find our peace, find our fulfillment, find our identity in him. Is your peace in the Lord tonight? Is your satisfaction in the Lord tonight? Is your identity in the Lord tonight? Maybe you're here and you would say, listen, Pastor Brigham, I've never given my life to God. I've never given him control. I've never told him, you are God and I am not. Have your will. If that's you tonight, in a moment after we prayed, I'd love to invite you to come up to this altar and pray with one of these folks and tell them, listen, I've never given God everything, but I want what he wants for me because it's better than anything I could want for myself. And maybe you're here and you'd say, listen, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but I have been straining to hear God's voice. I've been straining to know what God wants for my life, but I can't seem to hear. Tonight, it is time to choose to desire him more, to desire his destiny for your life more, to give yourself over even anew, afresh and anew, to recommit yourself specifically to his will, his way, and to be willing to wait. We get so impatient. God, I'm not hearing from you. God, I'm not hearing from you. God, I'm not hearing from you. And he's He's on the way. If that's you tonight, you're a believer. You know the love of God, but you've been straining to hear his voice in your life. Then let tonight be the night that you choose. In just a moment after we've prayed, to make yourself, make your way up to this altar. And make yourself available to his voice. To wait. To be still. Would you stand to your feet all over this place for a word of prayer? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? And I want to ask this simple question. Is there anyone here tonight who would say, I need to desire the destiny of God more? Is there anyone here tonight who would say, I need to give my life to God? If that's you, if you need to give your life to Jesus, even for the very first time, no one else looking around except for me, would you just slip a hand up high enough for me to see? God bless you. God bless you. To my right, your left, I see that. Is there anyone else tonight? I need to give him my life. Hallelujah. Father God, we are grateful that your word comes with promises. You don't just leave us with a task. No, God, you inspire us with your reward. God, your righteous reward in and through us. You promise it will shine like the noonday sun. You are going to give us more from you. And there's nothing that compares to it. Nothing that outshines it. Nothing we can gain here in the world is greater than your destiny for our lives. And when we desire more of you, you speak clearly your perfect will for our lives. So Lord, tonight, we choose, we choose to want the things that you want. To desire from the depths of our heart you and nothing more than you God we desire nothing more than you be in this place oh God we pray in Jesus name we pray all these things amen and amen listen if you 
If you want to take that time, these moments right now, these altars are open. If you raised your hand tonight and you, you said, I know that I need to give in my life, then don't hesitate. Here, as, as, as Tanya and the worship team lead us in song, you just make your way down to pray with one of these folks. But if you're here and you know that you know the Lord, but you need to desire him more, you need to hear his voice, you need to be still, then come and let's spend time around these altars seeking him and waiting patiently upon the Lord. Come on, let's worship.